Good evening and welcome to one and all. My name is Shashank from Clanet, the designated session assistant for a seamless experience. And Clanet is India's most trusted and widely used Digitech platform with multiple enriching services exclusive for all the doctors. Clanet is very proud to be a digital partner for this event organized by Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology. And the today's topic of the session would be Model 4 Refactory Rickets. Let's begin today's session for which I would like to invite you Dr. Jitendra sir to take over. Kindly proceed with your talk, sir. Uh, thank you, Sasank. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, today's you know, webinar will be on refractory rickets overall approach. Before we you know begin with this uh, webinar, we'll have the pre-test and the link for same I'll be sharing in the uh, chat box. So delegates, please uh, attempt the quiz uh, from the chat box links. I've shared it in the chat box. For participants who have joined late, you know, we have said, uh, said the link for pre-test in chat box. I'm sharing it again. You can attempt pre-test from the link.
So, uh, good evening and uh, welcome again to today's MAFRO webinar. So, we are, you know, already uh, 10 minutes past 7 o'clock and we have given you know, 10 minutes for pre-test. So, now we'll be proceeding with uh, today's webinar. So, as already been, you know, uh, told today's webinar topic is a overall approach to refractory rickets. And today's session will be moderated by uh, Professor Arvind Bagga and uh, Jyoti Sarma, ma'am. So over to you, ma'am. I think uh, sir will be you know, a bit busy. So ma'am, you can begin the proceedings. Uh, thank you, Jitendra. I think sir has already joined though. Sir, would you like to introduce the topic, sir? Good evening, sir. I think ma'am, sir is a bit busy, so you can begin. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. Uh, so today's topic of resistant rickets is an important subject because uh, not only does uh, for right now you're focused on exams and uh, I can assure you that it always comes up in the exams either in the theory paper or in vivas and often both. But more importantly, when you soon you will be practicing pediatrics and it is a very important case. You will often be seeing these patients. So with this, I would request Quest now, and today this topic is going to be discussed by Dr. Aditi Sharma, who is an associate professor of pediatrics at Command Hospital Chandimandir. She will be uh, uh, presenting the how to uh, the theory part of it and describing the pathophysiology and management. While Dr. Abhishek Abhine, who is an associate professor at the Division of Pediatric Nephrology Department of Pediatrics at Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. We'll be taking you through the cases. So over to Ad Dr. Aditi Sharma first. Aditi, may I request you to please begin? Thank you. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I'll just share my screen. I hope the slides are visible. Yes, please go ahead. So good evening, everyone. So uh, today, the topic of our uh, discussion is refractory rickets, the approach and management, which is, as ma'am mentioned, a very important OPD topic. Uh, we'll be covering the topic with some interesting facts about vitamin D and rickets. Uh, the whole uh, presentation is interspersed with pathophysiology because there are various pathophysiologies for various kinds of rickets. And uh, discussing the clinical features, which are universal to all kinds of rickets and, rickets and specific to specific disorders. Then for the ease of categorization and learning, we would understand what is calcipenic versus phosphopenic rickets. And thereafter, summing up our approach to a patient who lands up with rickets in our OPD. Then will be the take-home points and case-based discussion by Dr. Abhishek. So, uh, the bony disorder, which is akin to the present day rickets, was talked uh, in Greek and Roman writings as long, uh, it dates back to first and the second AD. But it was in the 17th century when these two researchers, uh, Glisson and Whistler, uh, they mentioned and summed up the clinical features in their dissertations. But however, the term rickets was still debated because it was coined maybe uh, after the name of apothecary or the so-called pharmacists in London who used to give treatment for those bony disorders or uh, it came from uh, the word rickettes, which uh, meant the inflammation of the uh, backbone. But however, till this time, the main cause of uh, rickets was associated with uh, as a disease of poor and mainly the nutritional cause. And in their census of deaths in London, rickets was also in 17th century uh, denominated as a major cause of death, mainly amongst the children. However, in 19th and 20th century, vitamin D was discovered and cod liver oil was used for the treatment of the same by these two scientists. And in, in between these two eras, there were some cases, there were cases of frequent cases, I would say, of rickets 
which were reported from the rich and it used to run in families uh, you know discovering various hereditary form of rickets however in the 20th century uh, we came to know about the fibroblast growth factor 23 and its role in rickets where phosphate became the main denominator to the current era of brosumab which is a antibody which we'll discuss later so just a brief pathology of rickets if we understand it is due to the abnormality of the growth plates now in figure b you see a healthy bone with the epiphysis the growth plate which is mainly made by the chondrocytes and the metaphysis now the chondrocytes they have to undergo apoptosis and there has to be mineralization of this cartilage matrix to give rise to a finely trabeculated bone but what happens in rickets is the apoptosis of the chondrocytes and its subsequent mineralization of the, this matrix it fails to note here is that phospho phosphate phosphorus is a major element which plays a major role in the chondrocyte apoptosis now it what it does is it phosphorylates the mitogen activating protein kinase pathway and this pathway is important for the apoptosis hence low phosphate terminates the apoptosis and when apoptosis gets terminated what happens is there's expansion of these hypertrophic chondrocytes and it makes the uh, diseased bone look somewhat like this they are hypo hypertrophied non apoptotic chondrocytes and the linear arrangement of the trabecular network is lost so there is irregularity here so these things lead to typical bony changes which we seen that is widening of the growth plate widening of the growth plate is due to expansion of those hypertrophic chondrocytes because there is no vascularization then there's loss of provisional zone of calcifications we can't see any calcification in the metaphysis and there is fraying there's fraying of the junction we can't make out where the growth plate and the where the metaphysis is exactly and there's widening or splaying of the metaphysis per se and all these changes are recorded in rapidly growing bones which is mainly the distal end of radius ulna or the distal femur and the proximal tibia fibula the metaphysis of the long bones showed uh, you know typical coarsening of the trabecular pattern but it might not be visible depending upon the exposure of the x ray so these bones become very uh, spongy and give rise to you know and very soft and give rise to various skull fractures frontal bossing in infants rickettic rosary where the costochondral junctions are expanded some features of you know craniosynostosis with some hereditary forms can be seen typically wrist widening would be there and uh, the very well known deformities of the lower limbs in the form of genu valgus and varus valgus varus and the wind swipe deformity where the curvature is on the same side give uh, our as a uh, uh, contribute to the clinical features of rickets so uh, talking about rickets the first element which comes to our mind is vitamin d and everyone uh, of uh, us is well versed with the metabolism of vitamin d it's available in the form of polycalciferol from the plant and animal source and also from the skin by exposure of sunlight the first hydroxylation uh takes place in the liver with the help of this gene and another hydroxylation takes place in the kidney with the help of this gene to give the active form of vitamin d in the body which is calcitriol which leads to increased calcium reabsorption increased calcium absorption from the intestine and increased uh calcium turnover from the bone with the help of this gene there is uh you know inactivation of this active form and it goes into inactive form here so this active form of vitamin d that is calcitriol is the major trigger for the calcium absorption and man maintaining adequate levels of calcium in the body so coming to the pathophysiology per se when there is low levels of uh, vitamin d per se leading to low levels of active form of vitamin d that is calcitriol what it will lead to impaired intestinal calcium absorption so when there's a drop in the calcium set point in the serum it leads to secondary hyperparathyroidism 
So secondary para hyperparathyroidism, what, what does it do? It increases the calcium absorption by increasing 1-alpha hydroxylase activity, which restores the calcium balance in the serum. But at the same time, secondary hyperparathyroidism also leads to increased phosphate excretion from the kidneys. So it decreases calcium excretion and increases phosphate excretion, leading to low serum phosphate levels. So all these compensatory mechanisms uh, compensate for calcium, and hence we get normal calcium, calcium levels. However, the underlying low serum phosphate levels still leads to hypophosphatemic uh, manifestation of rickets, where we have all these radiological features, we have those growth plate abnormalities and the chondrocyte uh, hypertrophy. However, if there is failure of compensatory mechanisms, then uh, there is severe hypocalcemia, and we can get hypocalcemic complications in the form of tetany, seizures, or dilated cardiomyopathy. So these are uncompensated features, and these are compensated features. However, in the uh, presence of nutritional deficiency, when there is low serum phosphate, there is an ongoing uh, process which leads to rickets. However, the hypocalcemic manifestations don't turn up. So this uh, leads us to an important uh, concept of, of hypophosphatemia being the common denominator in rickets. So in all types of rickets, universally, the phosphorus levels will be low. And depending upon the uh, calcium levels, we have calcipenic rickets where serum calcium will be low. And this can be nutritional or various hereditary forms of calcium, uh, of uh, calcium deficiency rickets. Now, what, it ha what happens is that whenever there's a low calcium levels due to vitamin D deficiency per se or hereditary forms of vitamin D uh, rickets, there is increased parathormone. So increased parathormones leads to renal phosphate phosphates, phosphates uh, wasting. However, another form of rickets, that is phosphopenic rickets, is where there are certain mechanisms which can be hereditary or which can be syndromic, which lead to low serum levels of phosphate. Now, why these low serum levels of phosphate? Because they uh, prevent the renal resorption of phosphate and we have phosphaturia. So, Per se, phosphopenic rickets comprises of the disorders where all of these lead to renal phosphate, phosphate wasting, hypophosphatemia, and hence the manifestation of rickets. Whereas in calcipenic rickets, there initially there is low calcium levels, which leads to secondary hyperparathyroidism, which leads to renal phosphate wasting and rickets. We'll come to this table once again. So what is the appropriate level of these elements, which are the major uh, key players in the determina determination of rickets. So the major elements are calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase, and the TMPGFR. So uh, this table shows the age-wise appropriate levels of all these elements uh, in pediatric and adolescent age group. And to note is that serum phosphorus levels are directly proportional to the TMP GFR levels. So an important uh, uh, con concept here is that the serum phosphate levels across all age groups are directly proportional to the TMP GFR, that is the tubular resorption of phosphate. So if tubular resorption of phosphate is low, a person is bound to have low plasma phosphate levels. Now coming to the nutritional part, which is the main cause of rickets, what are the uh, desirable levels of vitamin D and calcium in particular age group that is more than one year? So these are the cutoffs which defines the deficiency of vitamin D and calcium and sufficiency. So overall, uh, in more than one, uh, one year of age group, a child should have a daily calcium consumption of at least more than 500 milligram per day, and the 25 OH vitamin D levels should be more than 20. 
so these are the iap uh, guidelines and uh, these levels are known to all of us now because of nutritional deficiency there the there is low uh, poor nutrition or nutritional intakes there are less low levels of vitamin d and causing vitamin d deficiency so low vitamin d deficiency with lower normal calcium with low phosphate levels but a person having normal renal function would have nutritional rickets mainly it's due to poor intake but there are other risk factors like exclusively breastfed infants then uh, darker populations poor sun exposure and mothers having vitamin d deficiency across various hospital uh, based surveys we have seen that the vitamin d levels in our population uh, are less in uh, somewhere to 50 to 90% per, uh, of our population has insufficient levels of vitamin d across various hospital based surveys and a national survey done over two years with around 35000 uh, children said that vitamin d levels were less than 12 and it was they were more less in the age group from 9 to 18 that is a adolescent age group so this uh, gets us to the vitamin d deficiency management which is very well described by our iap guidelines we can follow daily regime or stos regime important to note here is that after a bolus dose of vitamin d or daily dose higher doses of vitamin d we need to continue the maintenance doses of vitamin d and along with with, with vitamin d an amount of calcium needs to be supplemented daily and monitoring would be uh radiographic healing of rickets and normalization of alp and vitamin d levels after 3 to 6 uh, weeks of the therapy so uh, this covers the major or the most common form of rickets that is the nutritional rickets now what happens when a patient who fails to show evidence of radiological healing or normalization of biochemical abnormalities despite adequate therapy with vitamin d and calcium so these cases are known to have refractory rickets and when do you consider a non nutritional causes of rickets at the onset it would be when there are radiographic changes in less than 1 year of age or in a slightly older child when there is a positive family history of rickets when the serum alkaline phosphatase which is universally elevated in nutritional rickets the normals are uh, the levels are normal and 25 ohd levels are normal so normal levels of alkaline phosphatase and vitamin d very low uh, levels of phosphate high levels of phosphate obviously and deranged serum creatinine in cases of ckd whenever there are extra renal manifestations in the form of any dental abnormalities or any uh, neurocutaneous markers or alopecia and very rarely abnormal radiographs uh, you know Uh, showing more theta in appearance of epiphyses or other changes these are the pointers towards other causes of rickets other than nutritional rickets which we will cover subsequently so to note is that early pointers biochemical pointers very importantly for non nutritional rickets are normal levels of alkaline phosphatase and vitamin d so in such cases the first thing which comes to our mind is chronic kidney disease where mineral bone disease is an important cause of uh, rickets which presents with bony deformities so the striking features would be a deranged creatinine and a very high serum phosph phosphorus level obviously the estimated gfr will be less along with uh, acidosis and low or normal serum calcium the treatment of ckd mineral bone disease will be covered in subsequent lectures but they are very well laid down criteria for the same the next cause for uh, non nutritional rickets to consider is cases of renal tubular acidosis distal more than proximal so they would present with a history of polydipsia polyuria they would have normal renal functions unlike a ckd there would be striking metabolic acidosis which which would be a normal and iron gap metabolic acidosis with hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia so the treatment and the pathophysiology of rickets in rta was well covered in the last lecture by dr jitender so we won't go into details of it just to recapitulate that uh, 
uh, rickets is more common in uh, common cause of rickets in RTA is the distal RTA, lowing, uh, requiring a low dose of alkali. And extra renal manifestations are more common in proximal RTA and long term follow up uh, uh, with the worsening of GFR is more common with distal RTA. Now, going ahead uh, to other forms of calcipinic rickets, we come to our uh, the algorithm where we said that hypophosphatemia is the common denominator. So going to this left part, which is the calcipinic rickets. So we have covered the nutritional rickets. The various hereditary forms of rickets here are as follows. That is vitamin D dependent rickets. So vitamin D dependent rickets is of two types, type one and type two with the uh, gene mutations as mentioned here. Striking thing to note here is that VDDR type two uh, is caused by mutation in the v VDR gene. Now, VDR gene is a nuclear transcription factor and uh, it has a DNA binding and a carboxyl terminal domain. So there's, there is a typical genotype phenotype correlation in VDDR type two, that is that the VDR mutations which are there in the DNA binding site are more uh, liable to cause alopecia. So the typical feature of VDDR type 2A, which is due to the mutation of VDR gene, particularly in the DNA binding domain of this gene, leads to alopecia in around 50 to 70 percent of children. And this alopecia can be uh, can start as early as an in infancy, and it's a marker of early development of rickets in these children. And not only the early development, but this the rickets in these children is more resistant to treatment. So this you have to remember. Otherwise, all forms of vitamin D dependent rickets are autosomal recessive. So just to recapitulate the calcipenic rickets, we have the nutritional uh, deficiency and we have the various forms of uh, VDDR, vitamin D dependent rickets. Sorry, vitamin D dependent rickets. The main denominator here is that there is universally, there is hypocalcemia there would be hypophosphatemia and uh, 25 OH vitamin D levels, 25 OH vitamin D levels would be normal in the hereditary forms of calcipenic rickets, whereas uh, it will be low in nutritional rickets. So this differentiates our nutritional uh, rickets from the other forms of calcipenic rickets. And another uh, thing to note, though 125-OH vitamin D levels are not done, but uh, uh, they are generally raised in type 2 VDDR. Treatment-wise, VDDR type 1 is treated with high doses of calcitriol, whereas where there is end organ resistant to calcitriol, we need even higher doses of calcitriol. And uh, we need sometimes IV calcium infusions also to keep these um, children in a steady state. The approximate doses of various um, treatments are given in this table. So now uh, moving from calcipenic rickets, we move on to the phosphopenic rickets. Now the phosphopenic rickets basically is an interplay of fibroblast growth factor, that is FGFR23. So FGFR23 is a hormone which is secreted by osteocyte and it causes, it is a phosphaturic hormone. It decreases the uh, renal absorption of phosphate from the proximal tubules via inactivating the um, phosphate, uh, sodium dependent phosphate uh, absorption channels and hence causes increased phosphate, phosphate loss of, in the urine, causing low phosphate levels in the <coughs> serum. So the main uh, uh, elements of phosphopenic rickets are the hypophosphatemic rickets, which are mainly dependent on FGF23. So FGF23 dependent uh, rickets, the hereditary forms are X-linked, autosomal dominant, and autosomal recessive. So to note here is that X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets is the most common form of all hereditary forms of rickets. It's the most common amongst all. So they are generally characterized by uh, disproportionate uh, short stature, dental abscesses, and uh, 
you know lower limb deformities in slightly elder children other uh, uh, syndromes due to uh, inherent fgf 20, uh, increased fgf 23 activity are tumor induced osteomalacia and mckeune albright syndrome because of genas activating mutations from here we also need to know that there are certain forms of phosphopenic rickets which are fgf 23 independent so uh, fgf 23 independent uh, rickets are uh, the type of rickets where fgf 23 has no role and they are purely caused uh, by the um, inactivating mutation of channels which are responsible for the phosphate uh, absorption in the uh, kidneys we'll come to it later carrying on with x linked hypophosphatemic rickets main features are hypophosphatemia it is x linked so a positive family history dental abscesses are characteristic fex gene involvement is there mutation in fex causes increase in the fgr fgf23 production from the osteocytes now what this fgf23 universally does in these uh, fgf23 dependent rickets is that firstly it decreases phosphate resorption by these two channels in the proximal renal tubules increasing the phosphate loss and causing subsequent hypophosphatemia it also decreases the parathormone levels and decreases calcitriol another way which it decreases calcitriol triol or the active form of vitamin d is by upregulating the cyp24a1 Uh, cy twenty four a one, which is responsible for the degradation of calcitriol, and down regulating this um, gene, which is uh, which is a uh, uh, which is required for the activation of calcitriol. So the effect of FGF is phosphaturia, decrease in the activated form of uh, vitamin uh, D, and decrease in the phosphate absorption from the gut. so all these things lead to decrease phosphate levels and uh, they lead to the typical changes in the bones which we have already described due to low phosphate levels so typically in x linked hypophosphatemic rickets we have low phosphate levels but to remember the alkaline phosphate which was universally raised in nutritional rickets will be uh, uh, will also be high here then tmp gfr will be low because phosphate is being lost calcium concentration will be low or it can be normal and pth is elevated important thing to note is that in fgf 23 dependent rickets the 125 oh2 vitamin d levels are appropriately lowered down because it acts on the cyp uh, genes to down regulate the uh, production of 125 active uh, Uh, activated form of vitamin D or calcitriol, and of course FGF levels are increased, but we rarely measure FGF twenty three levels. So the universal treatment of these kind of rickets is phosphate, which is given at this dose, and phosphate is always given uh, in multiple number of doses in a day because uh, the nadir levels are reached in one to one and a half hours. So it's very difficult to give phosphate in a child. but we have to give over 4 to 6 divided doses and our aim should be to normalize elp and not to normalize serum phosphate levels because it again causes um uh, hyperparathyroidism and uh, leads to decrease in the vitamin d levels in addition to serum phosphate we need to give calcitriol because fgf 23 is a inactivate inactivates calcitriol so uh, calcitriol is given and it is adjusted to the serum levels of pth and alp calcium requirement is normal as per the age but despite all these treatment these patients need orthopedic correction of the lower limb deformities and uh, <clears throat> in resistant secondary hyperparathyroidism uh, we might have to use sinacalcid and uh, for short stature we can use recombinant growth hormone till the epiphyses have not fused monitoring is very important since we are giving calcitriol we need to monitor the patients for hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis since conventional therapy to x linked hypophosphatemic rickets uh, is is not very promising so uh, now in 2018 there was the discovery of 
burosumab, which is an antibody of IgG type. Now, burosumab, what it does is it neutralizes, it, it has a direct neutralizing action on FGF23. And studies have shown that it has definite improvement in the radiographic changes and also in the mean height uh, standard deviations in the patients treated with this antibody. However, cost is an issue and availability is still an issue with us. So a word on uh, hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalcemia. So now this is one kind of rickets which is FGF23 independent. Why? Because the main reason is the mutation in this particular gene, which causes abnormal sodium dependent phosphate co transporter 2C. So, this um, receptor is mutated, and hence we have increased urinary loss of uh, phosphate and we get hypophosphatemia. Now, it is present in early childhood. It might cause hypercalciuria. Why hypercalciuria? Because uh, because of uh, increased levels of 125-OHD. So we don't treat these patients with calcitriol. We treat them only with oral phosphate replacement. There are certain disorders which do not come under the ambit of rickets, but then, of course, the radiological features will be, you know, as it looks like rickets. So you have to be careful while you are, you know, dealing with very rare conditions, but certain metaphysial dysplasias are Piles disease, which, which are caused by various mutations. And it also occurs in Blount's disease or achondroplasic patients. Another disease uh, is this stelose loret syndrome, where there's brachydactyly, acroosteolysis, and growth hormone deficiency. So these uh, syndromes per se do not have the patho underlying pathophysiology of rickets, but they are ricket uh, mimics, but very rare conditions. They just have the X-ray resemblance typically uh, with the X-ray of rickets. So coming to important clinical features that now we have uh, discussed various form of rickets. So what we can categorize is that when there is a, there are symptomatic hypocalcemic seizures or tetany, we must think of nutritional rickets or VDDR. Why? Because this is hypocalcemia. Alopecia typically occurs in VDDR type 2 because of VDR gene mutations we discussed. Syringomyelia, an, uh, um, analkyari malformation, and enthesopathies, and also dental abscesses are an important form of uh, part of X linked hypophosphatemic rickets. Enthesopathies are generally in, in adults, whereas AC malformations or craniosynostosis can occur in children also. Now, symptoms which occur after early childhood uh, are a part of autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets and tumor. Uh, 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 osteonecrosis. Caffiole macules are typical features of McCune albright syndrome and facial dysmorphism in kinds of dysplasias. Again, craniofacial malformations in RAIN syndrome. Typical hyper hypercalciuria with nephrocalcinosis with calculi. You should think of hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria and also in various kind of renal tubular acidosis. And with polyuria, polydipsia, you should always rule out Fanconi syndrome. So these are typical cl clinical features which can uh, you know, point towards a specific renal disorder causing rickets. So a child coming to us with rickets, the first tire of investigation which we need to do on a child is serum calcium, alkaline phosphatase levels, serum albumin, creatinine, and bicarbonate. Thereafter, uh, and along with it, uh, we do 25-OH vitamin D levels, alkaline phosphatase, and parathormone. Now, all these uh, biochemical parameters, which are mentioned in bold, will rule out most of the forms of nutritional rickets. It, it will rule out uh, chronic kidney diseases, and, and it might also point towards an RTA with a normal creatinine and abnormal bicarbonate, whereas deranged creatinine will straight away point towards chronic kidney disease. Now, based on these, we can do SGOTPT if ALP is high. And uh, these two levels <clears throat> are further needed for the characterization, but they are mostly not available. So they have been uh, written in a different color. For RTAs, we can do urine dipstick for protein, urine pH, and glucose. And 
to uh, a certain time during uh, chemistries, we need to study potassium, sodium, calcium, proteins, creatinine uh, for all these uh, biochemistries and beta-2 microglobulin to rule out any RTA. Then the calculations which are required is estimated GFR to rule out a CKD, then uh, uh, to determine calciuria, urine calcium and creatinine levels and TMP GFR for phosphaturia. So any the basic minimum investigations, the first year would be those mentioned in dark black color, that biochemistries and urine can be done for dipstick, which is easy to do. And in case there is some abnormality in the dipstick, you can go for spot or timed uh, urine samples for all these metabolites. And uh, in case there is some pointer towards hypophosphatemia or hypercalciuria, you need to uh, for, uh, do these calculations. So uh, coming to the algorithm for, um, you know, now that we have gone through various uh, kinds of rickets uh, beyond nutritional rickets, a simple algorithm which we can follow is whenever there is raised ALP and there are X-ray changes in a child, you first of all measure the serum bicarbonate and creatinine by to exclude this chronic kidney disease or uh, to ex exclude uh, any RTA at this level. Then uh, they universally have a low phosphate level apart from chronic kidney disease, which has a high phosphate level. So all other forms will have low phosphate level. Then what you do is you uh, do serum levels of parathormin. So all the forms of calcipenic rickets owing to low calcium would have high PTH levels. And all the forms with the uh, low phosphate, but normal calcium will have normal or low serum PTH levels. So when the PTH levels are high, next is we measure the serum levels of 25 OH vitamin D. Now, when these levels are low, we know that this is some kind of, uh, uh, it can be some kind of nutritional rickets also, whereas 25 OH, if it's high, it directly points towards hereditary forms of rickets. Another step would be to do serum levels of 125 OH, but since it's very unstable, routinely it's not done. When we come to this side where our PTH levels were normal, then we level measure the urine phosphate levels. So when there is phosphaturia per se, which is determined by TMP GFR, uh, this brings us to typical phosphopenic rickets where FGF level dependent, that is high FGF levels in these kind of rickets which we have studied. And in, in these X-linked hypophosphatemic uh, rickets is the most common, whereas a normal uh, 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 FGF3 levels or per se FGF23 independent would be RTAs like Fanconi syn syndrome or hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria. However, if there is no phosphaturia, it could be due to, you know, any intestinal malabsorption, intestinal surgery or very low uh, phosphate intake. So generally, these two levels are not available. So we follow an, an algorithm where we don't concentrate on FGF23 or 125OH uh, levels. So if we come to this, the main denominators of rickets would be serum uh, phosphates and alkaline phosphatases. Serum phosphate will be universally low in all kinds of rickets which we have studied and also alkaline phosphatase will be raised universally. Now, next we come to PTH. So the rickets which are calcium dependent, where calcium levels might be low, they all have an increased PTH levels. And if PTH levels are normal or uh, they are equivocal, then we concentrate on phosphopenic rickets. Now, in calcipenic rickets, the major denominator is the 25 OH vitamin D. 25 OH vitamin D is low in nutritional deficiency and some kinds uh, of PDDR. However, it is universally normal in hereditary vitamin D dependent rickets. And the major player in the phosphopenic rickets is our FGF23. Now, FGF23 uh, uh, FGF would be universally raised in all the forms of high, uh, 
hereditary hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets but in hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria which is non fgfr uh, dependent it would be low or normal however this algorithm is followed when we have ruled chronic kidney disease and rtas so to make our uh, thinking very easy the underlying etiology of any case of rickets would more or less with by far first thing we have to rule out is vitamin d or calcium deficiency after we have ruled out we need to look at the serum creatinines to rule out a chronic kidney disease that is more prevalent thereafter we need to look whether it is a case of rta or not and thereafter we come to the other forms of hereditary rickets amongst which x linked hypophosphatemic rickets is the commonest so exclude, exclude nutritional deficiency ckd will have high phosphate and exclude rta when there is a low phosphate level go to pth levels if they are high now they are calcipenic rickets if it's normal it's phosphopenic rickets in calcipenic rickets we look at 25 oh vitamin d levels and if they are low it's nutritional and if 25 oh vitamin d levels are by far normal it is hereditary vitamin d dependent rickets with some exceptions and in phosphopenic rickets we have to think about the fgf23 factor it can be fgf23 dependent and independent most of the hereditary forms of phosphopenic rickets are fgf23 dependent and it also includes certain syndromes where fgf23 directly plays a role in causing rickets however we routinely don't do the fgf23 or 125 vitamin d levels and what comes to our rescue is genetics where uh, we get a we get an answer for uh, various kind of uh, hereditary rickets so take home points from uh, our uh, today's presentation would be that we always need to think and to take a good history to rule out non nutritional cause of rickets so nutritional is always has to be ruled out but a family so what points in, pointers in the history would lead to non nutritional rickets were a positive family history of rickets would be a pointer at very early onset of rickets that is less than 6 months of age will be another pointer towards non nutritional rickets then we need to look at specific systemic and uh, clinical examination where you know features like dental abscesses alopecia um disproportionate short stretcher all these caffeoles point towards hereditary forms of rickets lab investigations should be appropriately interpreted and they have a major role in deciding or uh, the further way of work up of a case of rickets and it's important to use age appropriate interpretations in these lab values we should always not forget to play a, pay a very close attention to renal functions because chronic kidney disease has to be ruled out and of course management and follow up is at most important in these patients uh, in, in obviously in the patients of nutritional rickets and because there are lot of side effects related to the therapy of uh, rickets which is non nutritional so with this we come to the end of the presentation and uh, we now move on to the case based discussion thank you very much aditi for your very well illustrated talk and the simplified uh, algorithm at the end i now request dr abhishek to please uh, carry on with the case presentations okay ma'am thank you Actually, ma'am, I have not given option of slides here. Should be possible. It should be on the bottom panel. Uh, no, ma'am. 
They scroll across the bottom panel after reactions. There is one button. Chat, then reactions, then the share button is there. Uh, no, ma'am. There is option. There is option of more settings. Uh, raise hand, chat, question answer, participants. That's all, ma'am. Shashank, can you guide, please? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you could quickly you could quickly email the slides over to Jitendra or Aditi. They can project it for you. Ma'am, they, um, they can able to share their slides because all the panelists have the rights to have the like the button, uh, the just downside, the green color button, share screen. Green color button. Yeah. Okay. Can you see that? It's not there, sir. It's not there. Because we have joined from a browser, the problem is because of that. No. Yeah, must be. Uh, let me just check. Dr. Abhishek, uh, can you send slides to me? I'll say it. Yeah, yeah, I will say yeah. yes. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'd like to encourage the participants to uh, put their questions in the Q&A box. So, ma'am, there is a question. Maybe Aditi could respond to that in the Q&A. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, what are the treatment options for VDDR type 2? So like uh, I mentioned in my slide, so VDDR type 2 is typical form of vitamin D dependent rickets type 2 where there is endorgan resistance to calcitriol or the activated form of vitamin D. So we would <clears throat> like to give mega doses of calcitriol say uh, point, uh, uh, point 0.05 to 0.2 mics per kg per day. Along with it, we need to give oral calcium and phosphate also. But sometimes these children might require IV calcium infusions also. So mainstay of treatment would be higher doses of calcitriol, uh, calcium and phosphate supplements. And uh, if there is uh, hypocalcemic uh, features like tetany, we might have to give IV calcium infusion also. In fact, I think they're very difficult to treat if, and yes, uh, the calcium inf uh, infusions they require are often like you're supposed to get them in the hospital every night and give IV doses by central line. Uh, they're very, very difficult to manage. Hello, Dr. Jitan. Have you got my mail? I haven't, I haven't received your presentation i have sent now this jitender.2544 ms dot at the gmail dot com na this is your mail id yeah i got it now and give me Aditi, there's another question for you. Um, which type of rickets is a normal alkaline phosphatase? Uh, I guess uh, ALP, I guess, is a common, I mean, it's commonly or universally raised in all kinds of rickets. Mm. Yeah, except you know that the, except treat, that treat, perhaps. That if we have yeah. partially treated it or uh, we are near yeah. treating it. But yeah, but typically the distal RTAs and uh, Malnutrition, distal RTA particularly, they, they do tend to show low levels, perhaps. Um, yeah, but it would always be high. There is a condition that goes by the name of, hy of hyperphosphatasia. That can, yes, that is, yes, yeah, yes. that's characterized by low ALPs, but then it may not always have features of rickets. Yes, so hyperphosphatasia. Yes. And then there are, you know, abnormalities of uh, metaphysical dysplasia, Aditi. Maybe you can tell, yeah, while, yes. while we are, yeah. Yes, sir. so diseases apart from uh, rickets like skeletal dysplasias might have low ALP levels and hypophosphatasias, like sir mentioned. Yeah, they may have normal levels, you know, yeah. So they may look like rickets, but then the X-rays are quite characteristic. And uh, so, so yeah. I think we can proceed with case-based discussion. Okay, okay, sir. Please carry on. Good evening to all, sir. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, ISPN, for giving the opportunity to speak in this forum. I am going to with case-based discussion of refractory records. So, case one: 
A 12-year male child presented with chief complaints of not gaining weight and height for seven years. He has a lower limb deformity for last five years. At this time, he is presented with fever for 15 days and increased rate of respiration for five days. There is history of polyuria and polyudicia is there. There is history of intake of vitamin D and calcium, multiple doses in the past. On the examination, he is tachypneic. His mild pallor is present. And on the genuine welcome deformity is there. Weight and height is less than third centile. He is stented and bested. And he having stage two hypertension. Next. Next. So a 12-year boy presented with short stature and lower limb deformity with not responded to calcium and vitamin D treatment. And there is also history of polyuria and polydysphere with stage two hypertension. We kept the possibility of uh, RTA and vitamin D refractory decades and CKD. So with this possibility, we kept uh, uh, the investigation. First, we did ABG, we showed the metabolic acidosis. In fact, high and iron gap metabolic acidosis. Then, as per the algorithm, we did the serum phosphate level, which is very high. Further, we investigate in uh, urea creatine in renal profile, there is raised urea and creatine, and with with findings of rickets. So, in next, next. So, with abnormal renal function, high phosphorus, and low calcium with acidosis, metabolic acidosis, we kept uh, this is clear case, case of the chronic kidney disease with mineral bone disorders. Now, the, uh, so this main culprit is the in this case is hyperphosphatemia. So we started, uh, we, uh, in this case, we have to uh, give dietary restrictions up to the phosphate in this age group up to the 640 to 1250 milligram per day. And if dietary restriction is uh, not sufficient, then we can uh, add phosphate binder, most commonly cevelamer, at the 20 to 40 milligram per kg per day, up to, uh, maximum up to 1600 milligram per kg day. Per day. In case of uh, in, uh, resistant to all these, uh, uh, then we can plan dialysis, especially in a stage C. And sometimes secondary hyperparathyroidism is less. For for this, we can add vitamin D and low calcium, uh, vitamin D and sometimes calcimimetic agents, tina calcite, which is not uh, currently recommended for the pediatric populations. And sometimes APTS is raised more than more than, in fact, more than thousand uh, picogram per day. Then we can plan for parathyroidism. These, these things are uh, better dealt with in future classes. Now coming to case two, five-year female presented with chief complaints of deformity of both lower limb for four years, swelling of both wrist joint for three years, pain in the both lower limb for two months, and their family history in the, in the, the wrist joint in the youngest sibling. And he also, he, he also received multiple doses of, mega vita, of vitamin D3 for the past, past three, four years, but there was no improvement. Next. On examination, there is bilateral genuverum deformity is there, anterior bowing of legs is there, and there is uh, widening of wrist and with delayed uh, dentations with other features like restricting rosary and double malleolary present. So in our in the, on the examination, this child is bested and stented. On the anthropometric examinations, this child is being underbed with the severe, uh, severe stentings. Next. So five-year female with lower limb five-year female with lower limb deformity with family history and teeth involvement and received multiple doses of mega, dose of vitamin D with, without any response with bed higher less than third centile. We again uh, did investigation on the line of refractory predicates. So uh, the investigation the real, they said they analyzed osteopenia with the uh, deformity seen in the uh, wrist joints. With again, this time phosphate, uh, first we did uh, as a protocol, phosphate is, uh, did, then phosphate is lower in this case, so or with uh, no, with uh, there is no acidosis with normal IPTS, and there is in case this is increased calcium creatine ratio. So in these features, in the basis of this, we kept the possibility of next uh, next. So we can uh, simply see if any child suspecting refractory triggers, we first do serum phosphate level. If there is high. Then uh, go. Uh, then this uh, pointer towards the CKD. In this cell, their serum phosphate is low. Then we did ABG. ABG uh, is normal in the, uh, normal ABG. Then we did serum calcium and phosphate. In this case, there is normal parathyroid and calcium, as very much described in previous talk by Dr. Aditi. 
so this is the suspected case of hypophosphatemic rickets so or in in, in view of that there is increased calcium calcium creatine ratio is there there is hypercalciuria is there so this is most probably hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with the hypercalciuria next so it uh, is generally present after the infancy with predominantly lower lumen involvement and in absence of hypocalcemia as in the our case so child was started on the oral phosphate supplement 30 to 50 mg in multiple doses because it is rapidly absorbed and secreted it came in the name of at phos which contains sodium as sodium acid phosphate potassium bicarbonate and sodium bicarbonate each sachet of at phos provide 500 mg in urine phosphate patch sachet it's uh, some uh, our it came under joule, joule solution which gives to 30 mg in urine phosphate per ml so Uh, or some different type of hypophosphatemic rickets is there some are the F fgf 23 dependent or some are um, uh, with low uh, and dependent as very much described in the previous talk by dr aditi so most common is xlim as described earlier talk in, uh, is mediated by hex gene mutation this is in case this this are early presentations and with the, the this proponent short stature with dental abscess and craniosynostosis in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in this case this is the case of the hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with the hypercalciuria next now coming moving to case 3 a 12 year a 2 year male boy presented with complain of loss of scalp hair it was onset at 6 month of age and gradually progressed to complete hair loss at the uh, by 11 months of age he is able to unable to stand on walk without supports he is only able to step uh, walk two to three steps but there is no history of delayed cry at birth no history of abnormal body movements and no history of polyuria and polydipsia next on treatment and family history baby has received vitamin d for one months at 10 months of age born out of by the non consanguineous marriage there is no history of development delay in the any other siblings all female sibling are healthy no history of similar complaining any family members and there is history of expiry at uh, day one of life uh, male child due to respective distance next on to on to pometric measurements he uh, comes under the severe underweight with the severe stunting with moderate wastings next on examination there is alopecia totalis is there faint bilateral eyebrow bilateral wide disc joint is there or uh, rest systemic examination are within normal limits again with uh, bested and stunted child with the alopecia again pointed towards the refractory case they, they, in this case we did the investigations yes already uh, or x ray or blood investigation and x ray shows the flexor line growth rate widening cupping and fraying and the wrist joints and in serum uh, investigation the serum calcium is low serum calcium is low alkaline phosphate is raised and ipth is highly raised this is examples of calcipenic rickets or vitamin d dependent rickets so in this case there, there is uh, there is confusion uh, between calci uh, like uh, nutritional or calcipenic rickets Uh, vitamin D dependent we do D one twenty five hydroxy vitamin D so it is also raised so in view of uh, in these investigations next vitamin D dependent tickets was kept that uh, was confirmed what are the pointer in this case there is developmental delay alopecia total is finding of rickets in the form of high level of serum alkaline phosphate with increased IPTH or high level of one twenty one twenty five hydroxy polycalciferols. next so further this case is confirmed by the uh, mutations so uh, <coughs> or the mutated uh, genotypes variants are shown the rickets with vitamin d resistant type 2 is likely pathogenic with bd bdr mutation which bind with leads to especially in alopecia in uh, leads to alopecia in case of type 2a vitamin d dependent type 2a next so different type of bdrs type uh, type a type type 1 type 2 type 3 which is already very well discussed by the dr aditi so, so BD, pointers of by vitamin d uh, type 2a is, is alopecia it's uh, and in case of bdr1 generally present in in, in in fancy with hypotonia x so in this case due to receptor uh, defect is there and the receptor resistance is there so there is single Uh, generally, supra physiological high mega dose calcium oil is needed. 
so given the high uh, high super, uh, supra physical dose of calcium trial followed by maintenance dose of vitamin d and oral calcium supplement was given at the 100 mg per kg per day patient was discharged on the maintenance dose of vitamin d calcium supplement and iron supplement advice for follow up after one month next so this slide i already discussed next so coming to the my like last case is for this 15 uh, 15 year old boy presented with progressive knee bending for 8 years associated with pain and swelling of both knee painful swelling of wrist for last 8 years the boy was born out of second degree consumers marriage and he was absolutely normal at 8 years of age there was no history of seizure tetany fractures hematuria renal stone excessive thrust delayed dentations dental abscess and chronic diarrhea thanks Uh, again, he my own examination. He was stented and malnourished. With upper segment to lower segment ratio was 1.2. He had been born age of 11 years. He had again the new helium deformity with the broadening of wrist joints. There, there were no features of hypocalcemia or other bony or skeletal deformities. Next, on investigation, as per the chart, we did serum phosphate level, and then ABG. Then in this case, ABG so normal anion gap metabolic acidosis with low potassium, with raised uh, raised calcium creatinine ratio with increased urinary pH. So we kept the possibility in this case is a RT, this RTA, distal RTA. US, again, so we did USG, USG so there is nephrocalcinosis. Next, so yeah, as per the chart, a simple chart. Again, this uh, category child fits in the this. Uh, uh, this have a normal phosphate, a low phosphate with the normal anion gap metabolic acid. This fits in RTA. So the pointer, the pointer are low phosphorus, normal anion gap metabolic acid is an hypokalemia, increased urinary calcium protein ratio, or nephropolysis. Most likely, this is the distal RTA. Distal RTA. This is case of the distal RTA. Next. so he be did uh, hearing screen this was normal he was started on alkali therapy with 3 to 5 mg equivalent per uh, per kg by carb per day followed by the followed by for follow up visit at 6 month of follow up bone pain and muscle weakness have subsided blood ph serum by carb and potassium level has been improved in this case pre treatment next we can see clear cut picture difference in the pre treatment x ray showing rachitic changes in post treatment x ray resolution of rachitic changes next so uh, so uh, add on with the dr aditi message i my take home message is pointer especially for when to suspect what are the pointers for the respective regards with uh, the age of presentation is less than if age of presentation is less than 6 month or more than 2 years there is family history or is there any child presented with alopecia or there is failure to thrive or polyuria or child not responding with adequate or adequate dose with uh, multi vitamin b therapy if child having sometimes jaundice in the case of other non nutritional like in some case wilson disease or child presented with hypertension thank you and uh, thank you thank you dr abhishek for a nice presentation uh, so do we have any questions in the chat box that are left aditi no sir all have been answered sir yeah there was a question you know so from so we'll probably go back to that question uh, dr aditi sharma can when can bony deformities and rickets be corrected surgically what would be the requisites so what would you kind of um, so suppose somebody has got marked deformities at what age would you correct so uh, bony deformities invariably in hypophosphatemic rickets they need orthopedic uh, correction and uh, they should be corrected once the epiphysis has been uh, closed and we would like to achieve uh, uh, near uh, normal levels of alkaline phosphatase uh, and 
slightly lower levels of phosphorus and uh, maybe appropriate levels of PTH with our therapy with phosphate and calcitriol before we attempt uh, this thing. Surgery. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. You know, when one would probably wait till the till the child has attained the height, but you know, at times this may be too late. It, yes, so it and could be done earlier yeah, if it's very severe. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and as long as you are metabolically, it's... yeah, you're right. You know, as long as you are metabolically okay, you know, and uh, suppose and you've been metabolically okay for a while because correction normally requires osteotomies, and yes. uh, then and then putting them on them on plaster. So you need to be, you know, able to heal your bone, and uh, so clearly, you know, it can be done even earlier because at times delaying it too long may not be, maybe, you know, maybe perhaps detrimental in terms of. Uh, bones about in terms of Boeing and so on. Sure. So you need to really have, uh, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, there's another question, Abhishek. X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, is it dominant or recessive? X-linked hypophosphatemic is uh, autosomal dominant, sir. So it's X-linked dominant disorder. Uh, yes. So the mothers would also show that as well as uh, siblings. Uh, so, so it could happen, you know, in more than one sibling. Mm -hmm. And there are families Yes, all of us have encountered. So, uh, Aditi, could you just tell us uh, what are the precautions while children are on high dose vitamin D or on, um, say, even nutritional vitamin D supplements or whatever you know? So, uh, so particularly, uh, we follow two kinds of regimes. Both are recommended. One is the bolus therapy and one is the daily therapy uh, of vitamin D. But however, uh, uh, there have been no... Uh, uh, both the therapies are comparable I mean, there's no benefit of one over the other per se in the treatment of nutritional rickets, but the side effects to higher doses of vitamin D are more common with the bolus therapies. And uh, it would be like, you know, onset of headaches, benign uh, raised intracranial hypertension that could be there with the uh, higher levels of uh, uh, bolus doses of vitamin D could be there. But suppose you are using 125 dihydroxy for say, Excellent rickets. Yes. So in case, yes, would, sir, in hmm, case yeah. uh, we are using calcitriol uh, in the treatment of hypophosphatemic rickets, like we have mentioned in our uh, presentation also, one should definitely uh, look for um, uh, hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. Also, uh, another indicator for abnormal, uh, for uh, over-treating, yeah, over-dosing with the calcitriol uh, would be a very suppressed level of parathormone. So you need to look at the parathormone levels. They should not be widely suppressed, uh, uh, major, majorly suppressed. And also uh, increased doses of calcitriol might lead to uh, hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. Okay, so you monitor for, for the urinary calcium? And so we said, monitor, yes, sir. We we can monitor uh, urinary calcium. We can do a spot uh, urinary calcium creatinine ratio, which should a uh, normal uh, is around 0.2, or we can use a 24 hour uh, calcium and creatinine excretion where uh, uh, levels more than 4 milligram per kg per day are indicators of hypercalciuria. So we need yeah. to keep a watch on that. Abhishek. What are the differences between 1-alpha D3 and suppose, suppose you don't have the calcitriol? Can, yes. can you manage with 1-alpha D3 instead? And are there any major differences in there, in, in the two drugs? Because most of us have been used to, you know, using 1-alpha D3. 1-alpha, pardon, sir? Is there a difference in, suppose you don't have calcitriol, yeah. can you use 1-alpha uh, D3 instead? Uh, in the... For say uh, hypophosphatemic rickets, where you want to use 125 dihydroxy, oh. it depends upon sir, uh, which is uh, uh, FGF23 mediated or not. In case of the yeah. sir, if uh, uh, X-linked or dominant variety or like the FGF3 mediated, there is no need for give uh, vitamin D. But in case of uh, hypophosphatemic rickets with uh, hypercalciuria. Uh, we uh, can't use uh, calcitriol or vitamin D3, but in case of X-Lin, there is uh, FGF23 mediated. It also acts on the renal tubule to, uh, 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 to decrease phosphate by uh, phosphate and it also de uh, decreases the 125 hydroxy uh, levels. So in that case, we can give, otherwise there is no need to give. So. 
Okay, so I think the, the key messages here are that obviously you do not need to give the active form except when the disease is FGF mediated, yes. uh, which could happen with X-linked rickets as well as other forms. And in those patients, you would use 125 dihydroxy D3. If you don't have access to 125 dihydroxy D3, I'm, we are quite happy using one alpha D3 as well. So you can just use one alpha. And because yes. that's metabolized by the that's metabolized by the liver, Aditi, would you want to say something? So, uh, so just that uh, the equivalent doses of alpha calcidiol uh, might be say around uh, uh, twice of that of calcitriol. Absolutely, uh, yeah. When we are using calcidiol instead of calcitriol, I think that would Absolutely. be, and we are more uh, uh, used to using alpha calcidiol. Yeah, yeah, we are, we, yeah. Overall, you yeah, we are used to using more alpha calcidiol. Yeah. So there's a question in the chat, in the Q&A box. Should we continue calcitriol after correction of rickets in Excel uh, HR? So Aditi, will you answer that? So, okay, should we continue calcitriol after correction of rickets in X-linked hypophosphate? So, um, in X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, like we've mentioned, it is FGF23 dependent and FGF23 directly inactivates uh, calcitriol. So I think a calcitriol would be needed, obviously, uh, in modest doses. But uh, I, uh, I think correction of rickets is um, uh, not 100% possible in X-linked right. hypophosphatemic rickets. Absolutely, right. Absolutely. So, it never really so gets straight, huh, And calcitriol need to continue, but that uh, dose has to be titrated depending upon the uh, PTH, depending upon the hypercalciuria levels. It has right. to be titrated. Yeah, it never so really right. gets corrected. Yeah, yeah. So you, do remember, you know, that uh, in X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, uh, if you really look at the literature, uh, there was data that even phosphate could lead to healing alone. But uh, but it's not so, and 1-alpha obviously adds to that thing, you know. So I would imagine that one would continue 1-alpha because it also helps in stature. And, and so clearly if the answer to your question was, do you continue? Yes, you continue. But as uh, Aditi just said, and as Dr. Jyoti also said, you know, keep a watch on for hypercalciuria. We have seen problems of nephrocalcinosis because of hypercalciuria. And uh, so just be careful, you know, because uh, because you're using, and uh, yeah, so, so keep a watch. If, uh, and so the dose may need to come down. Hopefully you answered it, yeah. So last question, Aditi. How frequently should we monitor vitamin D level and other parametabolic parameters after starting therapy? Now, this, I think, is means for nutritional rickets. So, in nutritional uh, rickets, uh, like we mentioned, the biochemical parameters should settle by three to six weeks and x ray should resolve by around uh, 12 weeks. And um, Thereafter, we need not give the bolus doses, but we continue the maintenance therapy. That is the uh, daily RDA requirement of vitamin D and daily calcium uh, requirements. That's more than 500 milligram per day and uh, RDA of vitamin D of around 400 international units per day. I think we should uh, continue the uh, same. Now, this RDA... Uh, depending upon, you know, we can counsel the uh, parents uh, about uh, diet fortification and the type of diet which uh, has more of calcium and vitamin D. But uh, the maintenance doses have to be given for around three months along with the bolus doses. And yeah, uh, thereafter, and then, we, yeah. we, we need not repeat uh, x-rays thereafter once there is evidence of healing, especially uh, in nutritional records. Once you show sign of, uh, once you show a line of healing at about four weeks, six weeks, uh, you don't need to be doing more X-rays. We normally don't monitor vitamin D levels, and you assume you know that once you have started therapy, this should take be taken care of. Definitely, you should probably do a biochemistry once, but not too early. Again, you know, maybe something like six weeks or eight weeks to just show that things have returned. I'm sure there are guidelines on this, and one could refer to them. But uh, but doing vitamin D levels is not required. We agree, you know, that toxic levels of vitamin D may happen after a few weekly doses. And that's the reason why 
the number of weekly doses has declined you know you do know that the current guidelines i think aditi are 3 lakhs 60000 for five or what six doses five to six doses they say five to six doses so six. clearly this is much lower than the what it was before you know what you were used to using and the most for um, insufficiency and 10 for deficiency deficiency okay yeah. okay okay yeah and people would say you know rather than giving the full sachet you know give it over a period of time you know as you just said yeah uh, we can perhaps stop here and uh, Aditi, can i just make one comment sir please if yeah yeah I sure absolutely yeah, so yeah i just want yeah. to point out that uh, when we are talking about genu varam then we should not forget that they can have physiological act and when they are toddlers so we should not work up everybody for rickets that was just one comment that there will be physiological genu varam at between two and three years of age or one and a half to two and a half years of age Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, both the speakers. Um, thanks, Jyoti, for being a constant companion in all this. Thank you very well, much. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, and I want you. to, this is going to be my last session. So I want to thank you and Jitender and Aditi for giving me this opportunity of being part all of right. this very nice academic exercise. Not at all. It thank was great much. to have you, you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so thank much, Jitender. Yeah. Uh, Sasan, can you begin with your post? Uh, poll post test poll. Yes, sir. Yeah. Shall I start the poll, sir? Yeah, yeah. All right, sir. One moment. So I'm launching the first poll. Ten seconds left. Second poll would be launch. Twenty seconds left. Ten seconds left. End of the second poll. Launching the third poll now. Fifteen seconds left. Five seconds left. End of the poll for the third one. Now launching the poll fourth. Twenty seconds left. Ten seconds left. End of this poll now. Launching the fifth one. Fifteen seconds left. Five seconds left. End of the poll. 
launching the next poll. Twenty seconds left. Ten seconds left. End of this pool now. Launching the another pool. Twenty seconds left. Ten seconds left. End of the pull. Launching the another pull. Twenty seconds left. Ten seconds left. End of the pull. Launching the second last pull. Fifteen seconds left. Five seconds left. End of this poll. Launching the last poll. Fifteen seconds left. Five seconds left. End of the last pool. So, shall I share the results or? No, no, you don't need to Hello? share the result. We'll declare it at the end of the module. So, uh, thank you, Sasang. Okay, sir. And uh, once again, thank you, uh, Professor Bagga, Dr. Jyoti Sama, ma'am, uh, Dr. Aditi, and Dr. Abhishek for excellent discussion around refractory leakage. So, next uh, session in Nephro webinar will be on next Friday on approach to uh, nephrolithiasis. Uh, so till then, uh, good night, everyone. We'll, uh, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you for extending us this opportunity. Uh, I hope to host you again. With all you do, your permission, sir, I'm closing this session today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir.